So we have two Sundays left in the Ecclesia series. Ecclesia means church, the, the gathered assembly of the church, those that have been called out together is a Greek word for church. And we're looking specifically at the beauty of the local church. And I love the church. If you've known me for more than just a few weeks, you know that I love the church. And I don't think of church as big real estate, big address, big steeple, big baptistry. I think of church as family. Because as I study the New Testament, I see, and I study the Old Testament, I study all of the Bible, I see that Jesus didn't come to create a, a real estate empire. Jesus didn't come to create massive organizational structure. Jesus came to create a family. Those that are linked together through his blood, the common DNA of Jesus' blood. Jesus came to create a family, and then he came to send that family out into the world to take the world by storm. And as we continue to see the beauty of God's family, I want us to consider this morning, as we come in our, our verse by verse study in First Timothy, I want us to consider three words, the link between three words, contentment, godliness, and the mission of God. Contentment, godliness, the mission of God, and it's just coincidental that this this series in our verse by verse study falls right before the Christmas season. I know my kids were anxiously making Christmas lists yesterday. <laughs> There's joy to my ears when one of them said, "I think I've finished my list. There's enough on it." <laughs> He's done. Who? It was you. I wasn't going to call you out. It was Sean goes, he and Alexa were in his room together working on their list. And he says, no, Alexa, I think I'm done with my list. That was joy to my ears. But this morning, we're going to look at the link between contentment, godliness, and the mission of God. And how those three work together. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. If you have an app, go ahead and use your app. But I want to invite you, at the top of the YouVersion app, you see three letters. It's the version that you're in. If you're using an app, go to the CSB. I call that the Certified South Bradenton Bible. Um, they don't call it that, but that's what I call it because I live in South Bradenton. If you want a hard copy of them, we have some nice gift Bibles on our back table. You're welcome. Anyone here is welcome to take one of those. But I read and preach and study the CSB, Certified South Bradenton Translation. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. All who are under the yokes of slaves should regard their own masters as worthy of all respect, so that God's name and his teaching will not be blasphemed. Let those who have believing masters not be disrespectful to them because they are brothers, but serve them even better since those who benefit from their service are believers and dearly loved. Teach and encourage these things. If anyone teaches false doctrine... And does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness. He is conceited and understands nothing but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Will you pray with me as we look at these words today? Father, you are so good and so gracious, God. This is a timely word. Lord, your your word never returns void. We trust in your word. And I believe right now this text for us is a timely word for each of us. God, I pray that your spirit and your word would work together in our lives. And 
you would convict us because I'm convinced every one of us needs to be convicted by the words of Scripture this morning. Father, convict us where we need to be convicted. Affirm us where we need to be affirmed. But God, I pray that each of us would leave here today changed by the power of your word and your spirit working together in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So, one of the challenges of preaching through books of the Bible verse by verse is that you have to deal with topics. And you don't get to pick and choose which topics you deal with. And I, I honestly believe, for those of you that have known me more than just a few weeks, I believe the church is best served with this type of preaching. When it's consistently through books of the Bible or large sections of longer books of the Bible. That's how we've committed ourselves as a church to the preaching of God's word. I also believe that's how the preacher is most faithful to the call to preach the word by preaching primarily through books of the Bible. This is a text that if we were just picking topics, we would avoid. We would avoid because let's face it, we live in America and we are crazy rich in America. Like just by waking up in America, we're like massively wealthy based on global standards. <coughs> Roof over your head, running water. You're in the, 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 the wealthiest 20% in the world by having a roof over your head and running water. Um, this is a text that many of us would, would like to avoid, but we can't because God's word talks about contentment, godliness, and mission and how they all work together. So as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, I, just, I, I really mean that I hope all of us would be open to the word. Not something funny or witty that I say, but to the words of Scripture. God breathed Scripture. God inspired Scripture that we would be open to it. Verses 1 and 2 in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul talks about honoring masters as the heading there. And, and I want to be very, very clear that um, God's word does not affirm slavery. In fact, Man-stealing is what it was called in Exodus chapter 21, verse 16. Man-stealing was a capital crime. If you kidnapped someone, if you stole someone, you would be punished by death. Okay? The slavery, first century Roman slavery was more like indentured servitude, like employment, where people would sell themselves into slavery, sell themselves into a, a, a slavery position, and that would be a pathway to Roman citizenship. God's word never affirms slavery. It's evil and it's wicked, especially when, when as Americans, what we go to when we think of slavery, we think of, of how our country was first established, the African slave trade. That was wicked. It denied the image of God in people. It was wicked. Racism of all types is wicked. Absolutely wicked. It's sinful. It's deplorable. It's awful. It is wicked. Racism and slavery are wickedness. <clears throat> so I, I, I want us to be clear when we, when we hear these words in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, let's not hear those words in a distinctly American context. Let's understand that those were written in first century Rome, and it was, look, it was, if you sold yourself into slavery and you're a Christian, work hard. Work hard. Honor your master because that's you, you've gone into that relationship. Work hard. It has this is is not talking about the wicked evil of the how our country was established. I just want to be perfectly clear there. And if, if you want to know more on that specific topic, several months ago we worked through the book of Colossians and we dealt in detail about that topic. About how First century context is more of an employment relationship. The, the slavery, yes, people were treated badly. Yes, people were treated wickedly. But the overwhelming theme there is more like employment. Think employment. So that's kind of the prologue to our message today on contentment, godliness, and the mission of God. Then in verse 2, at the last half of verse 2, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Teach and encourage these things. Teach and encourage these things. What things is, is, is Paul talking about? He's talking about everything he's written so far. 
Everything is written in the letter. He's saying, teach and encourage these things. Everything that I've, that I've written to you about, this is what I'm calling you to teach and to encourage. Because Paul knows that there is a fruit of false teachers and there is a fruit of the gospel. There is an outcome of false teachers and there is an outcome of gospel teaching. He knows that there is a difference. And he's saying, look, teach and encourage these things. If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. See, almost tucked away in these verses is this truth that the gospel, the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, promotes godliness. Is the teaching that you're hearing week in and week out, is that promoting, is that pushing you toward godliness? If the answer is no, you need to throw out your pastor, you need to check your heart, you need to do something. But real teaching of God's word will always promote godliness. And that's the implication of verse Three is that there is teaching that does not promote godliness. It doesn't agree with, with the spirit of Christ through the words of scripture. When he says the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's not saying like the red letters are up here and then everything else is down here. Like all of this, all of this. He's saying if it doesn't, if it doesn't agree with this book, then it's not right teaching. There will be evidence of godliness in the life of Christians that are humbly receiving the word and rightly being taught the word. Hear me. There will be evidence of godliness in the life of Christians that are, A, humbly receiving the word and rightly being taught the word. Now, nowhere does it say perfection. Some of you have heard me talk a lot about the difference between perfection and progress. The difference between progress in godliness and instant perfection. Instant perfection doesn't happen. Just ask my kids. I mean, they'll tell you, like, dad's not perfect. Sorry, they'll, they'll say, well, yeah, clearly dad's not perfect. Just ask any of our spouses. Just ask any of our friends. Just ask any of our schoolmates. Perfection doesn't happen this side of eternity. But progress does happen. And the teaching of the, the local church is to promote godliness, to push us forward in godliness. So the question here, just, just think through as we, as we continue to look at the scripture is, are you growing in godliness? Somebody say, well, Paul, how can I tell? Here's how you can tell. Ask someone close to you that you know will tell you the truth. How can you tell if you're growing in godliness? Ask someone close to you that you know will tell you the truth. But be prepared for the answer. For some of us, asking our spouse may not be the best thing. For me, it's perfect because my wife is a truth teller. <laughs> and she knows the real me, not just the Sunday morning version of myself. Are you growing in godliness? Ask someone close to you be prepared. And right now, we've got 30 days till the end of the year. Countless people are going to start making, thinking about New Year's resolutions, right? Now is a perfect time. We have 30 days to the end of the year. Take inventory of your life. Do you see clear evidence of the grace of Christ in your life? Well, what does this look like? I, one way is how you treat others. How you treat others. How you serve and honor your spouse, your kids, your parents, your coworkers, your friends at school, your neighbors. Do you see, see evidence of the grace of Christ in your life? Here, here's another one. Do you see a growing confidence in <coughs> Jesus as you explore this book? Do you see a growing trust in your life, in Jesus, as you explore the pages of this book? Where were you three, six, or nine months ago? And have you seen the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life? Galatians chapter 5 says the fruit, singular fruit, one fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. 
it goes on to say, against such things there are, there is no law. But do you see evidence of God's grace in your life? Do you see the fruit growing in your life? The answer to that question is no. You need to check your heart. And repent. Right teaching promotes godliness. And then, and then if, as you check your heart, maybe you need to check the teaching you're listening to. I'm not afraid for you to check the teaching you're listening to on Sundays. I love for you to check the teaching you're listening to on Sundays. I'm not afraid at all. I'm not afraid. But here's what you check it against. Check it against this book. Check it against this book. And then check what other voices you're listening to. We listen to so much garbage. And that can be garbage. That can be well-intentioned garbage. That can be the advice of friends and family. That can be a friend in school that's not a believer. That can be a colleague at the office or at your workplace that's not a believer. That can be a, a mom or a dad, a mother-in-law, a father-in-law, whatever. But check the voices you're listening to. Because right teaching always promotes godliness. Always. Check your heart. Check the teaching. If you don't see yourself growing... If you don't see godliness growing, the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life, check your heart and check the voices you are listening to. And in contrast to right teaching that promotes, promotes godliness, he says the false teachers are marked by arrogance, division, and greed. And we've seen so much over the past few weeks in, in 1 Timothy about, about teachers in the church, about how they should be marked by humility. They need to be, to be men. God called and qualified elders are men in the church that are that are honoring Christ in their lives, teaching Christ in their churches. We've seen so much of that in the church there in the last few weeks. But in contrast to what we've seen, false teachers aren't interested at all in godliness. They're interested in being right. They're not interested at all in godliness. They're interested in being right. They're interested in arguing to the point of being right. And it says that they think godliness is a means to material gain. They're greedy. They're marked by division and greed. He says he is conceited and understands nothing, but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. From these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicion, and constant disagreement among people whose minds are depraved and deprived of the truth, who imagine that godliness is a way to material gain. See, brothers and sisters, there is a marked difference between teaching of Jesus leading to godliness and the false teaching in the world that leads to arrogance, division, and greed. <clears throat> and in contrast, the false teachers that were motivated by material gave money. They were motivated by money with minds filled with division and arrogance. Paul gives this incredible word, and I think this is a timely word for every one of us this morning. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, he says, But, but, godliness with contentment is great gain. But, it's one of the, one of the most powerful three letters used in all of the Bible. But, but. In comparison with, with the nonsense, the division, the arrogance, the greed, the conceit, the argumentation, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Kids, uh, sixth grade and down. What does contentment mean? Sixth grade and down. Anybody? Ella. You're happy with what? Happy with what you have. Satisfied, right? Can we say... Kids, I'm, I'm asking the kids, can we say that contentment and satisfied are, are kind of like the same thing? Kind of like the same thing, right? We're satisfied. I ate Thanksgiving dinner and I was satisfied. <laughs> right? A different kind of satisfaction. But contentment with godliness is great gain. Contentment and godliness. What does godliness with contentment look like? I opened my email. I'm, I'm way too connected. I get email nonstop and on my phone and 
everywhere. I don't get it on my watch, but I get it on my phone and my little tablet here and computer and email, email, email. And on Friday, just Friday, just Friday, I got, I counted it, and I don't know if I counted it right, but it was 56 emails about Black Friday, Cyber Monday. 56 emails. And every one of those emails was, was trying to convince me to spend money now, even if I had to pay for it later. Spend now, pay later. Spend now, pay later. Our economic engine on a national level is partly built on capitalism, but it's largely built on leverage, which means buy now, pay later. Buy now, pay later. And we have created entire events around spending money. Black Friday. Cyber Monday, which is all about spend, 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 spend. Like I said earlier, on a global perspective, we are crazy rich. Crazy rich as a nation and as individuals. And the, the challenge here is that godliness with contentment is great gain. To the challenge here is that we can chase after things or we can chase after Jesus. We can chase after things or we can chase after Jesus. But hear me, Jesus isn't going to take second chair to the American dream. He's not. Like, he's the king of the world. It says in the scriptures that by him, through him, and for him, all things were created, and he holds all things together. Do you think that king is going to take second chair to the stuff that every one of those 56 emails tried to get me to buy. I mean, everything from underwear to CVS pharmacy to iPads to cars to everything, big to small. Like, there's probably something in there about office supplies. I didn't even look at them all. But like, you think Jesus is going to take second chair to any stuff? No. Jesus won't take second chair to anything or anyone. Anything or anyone. Because godliness with contentment is great gain. In verse 7, he says, we brought nothing into the world and we can't take anything out. Every single trinket that was bought on Black Friday will one day rust away. Every one of them. Or the moths will eat it. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. And for Paul, the standard he had set for himself was food and clothing. See that in verse 8. I turn my page too early. It says, if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. So that was a standard that Paul had set for himself. Paul spoke a lot about contentment. I think that's a message the American church needs to hear. The value of contentment. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Not a little bit of gain, it's great gain. Because if, if we are content, we know that Jesus is enough. When we're content, when we're satisfied with, with what we have, not what, what we don't have, we know that Jesus is enough. That's what contentment says. It says Jesus is enough. In Philippians chapter 4, Probably one of the most misquoted verses in all the New Testament. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through, 9, through 13, and then verse 19. Paul writes to the church of Philippi, says, I don't say this out of need. He was praising them for their gift. He was praising the church of Philippi for supporting him. He says, I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make, with, make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. See, Philippians 4.13 is about contentment. I know what it's like to have an empty belly. I know what it's like to have a full belly. In all things, I have learned the secret of contentment. In all things, I can be content because of who Jesus is and what he has done in my life. 
My contentment is not derived in my bank account. My contentment is, was, was determined 2,000 years ago when Jesus was crucified, but then he raised from the dead. And then when I was seven, he called me to himself and he gave me life. My contentment is rooted in Christ, nothing else. Nothing else. Then he would say in verse 19, Philippians chapter 4, later he says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Contentment for the Christian isn't based on anything but Jesus. Not your job, not your bank account, not your wardrobe, not your kitchen pantry, not your grades in school, not your sports performance kids, not your kids' sports performance parents. I'm teaching. That's, that's to me, right here, to me. Your relationship status, the number of likes you get on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Contentment, deep, lasting, unchanging satisfaction can only be found in Christ. Because here's the deal about stuff. The more you get, the more you want. The more you want, the more you get, the more you get, the more you want. It's this non-ending circular pattern. But the secret to contentment with godliness is Jesus. Because when the foundation of your life is Jesus, when the reason you get up in the morning is Jesus, when the reason you work hard at your job is Jesus, when the reason you honor your children, you work hard to parent them well, and you openly confess when you screw up, the reason you do that is Jesus, you will experience contentment. When the reason you obey your parents isn't because you want to get a, a bigger allowance, but because you want to honor Christ, you will find contentment. Period. Jesus is all you need. If the foundation of your life is Jesus, it won't matter what you have or what you don't have. Jesus will be the source of your contentment. There is nothing compared to the joy and satisfaction of knowing Jesus. That's why when you see him, you know him, down deep in your soul, experientially when you experience the grace of Christ, the life that he has given you, you won't need anything else it won't matter if you've got a full belly or an empty belly, Jesus is all you need the joy of being a son and daughter of God Tim Keller, a pastor up in New York City Incredible pastor, planted the church in the 80s in New York City. He talked about the privilege of being a son or a daughter of God. And only a son or a daughter of the king would dare approach the king in the middle of the night for a cup of water. Through Christ, that's you and me. If you've turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus, you can approach the king at any time. Because you have been adopted into his family, guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. And you have sonship, privilege, daughtership, privilege. You are a child of the king of the world. And he delights in you. Let that fuel your contentment. Who you are in Christ. Peter wrote this. Peter wrote to the church that was experiencing tremendous persecution. Church tradition says that Peter saw his wife be crucified and he said, remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. He watched his wife die in front of him. Like the worst possible execution ever imagined. He says, remember the Lord. Here's what he wrote, 1 Peter chapter 1. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him. And you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Inexpressible and glorious joy. Jesus. 
I would suggest to you that only a life that has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's the good news of Jesus Christ, will ever experience meaningful contentment. Only a life that has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ will ever experience meaningful contentment. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. The flip side is that riches are terribly deceiving. Riches are terribly deceiving. In verses 9 and 10, he lays out for us the deceitfulness of riches, but those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. This past week, some of you know, Victoria, the kids and I, mom and dad, we all went out to Los Angeles, California to visit my brother and his wife for Thanksgiving. It's their first Thanksgiving out there. They moved out right before Christmas of last year. We went out to, to see them, spend a few days there, take in some attractions. And uh, one of the attractions we went to is called the La Brea Tar Pits. Anybody ever hear of that before? I had never heard of it before, like last April, first time I went to LA. Apparently, and it's this thing, and it's this fused tar, and there's all of these pits around, uh, around the, the, this little national historic site or whatever. And uh, sometimes you see the little tar bubble up. We actually got to see a couple of a couple of little spots where the tar was bubbling up from the ground. And the thing about the tar is that animals get stuck in it, and for hundreds and hundreds and more years, animals have been getting stuck in it, and once they get stuck in it, they can't get out. And they become fossilized. And paleontologists and all kinds of crazy scientists, bit like, I just, I didn't say crazy, because I, I can't imagine like studying dead, dead bones for a living, but whatever. Um, that's their thing, go for it. Um, all these kinds of scientists, they study the fossils, and they put together like dinosaurs, and. Uh, woolly mammoths and all this other stuff because they get fossilized. And there's this little sign that we saw and it said, you know, it's trying to explain the tar, explain the whole thing, signs and all these things are like fenced off, like eight foot high fences on under lock and key and you look between the gates because they don't want you know, people to get down there and get stuck, even though that happened once on a TV show that we used to watch. But um, anyway, so we see this, we see this little sign, we see this little sign and it says the tar is just like an insect trap, a glue insect trap. That once you get stuck, the harder you fight it, the more stuck you get. The more stuck you get. So like the more you fight, like you get your foot stuck, and then you, you try to get out, and the more stuck, every time you move, the more stuck you get, and the more stuck you get, and the more stuck you get. And what I would say is that the deceit of riches works just like that tar. Once you get the taste of it, the more you want. You get stuck in this pattern, you get stuck and you get stuck, and you get stuck, just like animals get stuck in a tar pit, and then a scientist a thousand years later, thousands of years later, comes down and sees their dead bones. See, the deceitfulness of riches is just like those tar pits, which I had never even imagined before I saw them. And once you're covered in it, it's too late. Paul says it will plunge people into ruin and destruction. talking about hell there. He's talking about hell there. Plunging people into ruin and destruction. To be so caught up with more, 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 more. Boom, you're dead and you stand before God and you you got nothing. You got nothing. And the next thing you know, you're spending eternity in hell. Like hell is real, folks. And, and think about how much Jesus warned about rich people. One out of seven verses in the Gospel of Luke talks, is addressed toward materialism and possessions. Jesus spoke more about wealth and money than he did about heaven and hell combined. Because he knows how deceitful it is. 
And hear me, all of us are rich on a global perspective. When you say, Paul, you ain't seen my bank account. <laughs> you ain't seen my hands or something. We're, we're both empty together. But uh, you know, they say, they say, Paul, well, you know, we're, we're not rich. But I think we need to reimagine what that word means. Because Americans, we've created a whole uh, a, a dictionary about wealth, like disposable income. Like, you know, the rest of the world thinks about survivable income. I've seen kids about the age of Sean Coast and Dylan carrying 50 pound bags of bananas down a mountain hoping to sell it for 50 cents. They're not thinking about disposable income, they're thinking about surviving for the next day. All of us have wealth, and we need to think through how we use what we have. See, it's not just Jesus talked about it, not just Paul talked about it, King Solomon talked about it in Ecclesiastes. It goes right in line with these last two verses. It says, the one who loves silver is never satisfied with silver. And whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. When good things increase, the, one who cons the ones who consume them multiply. What then is the profit to the owner except to gaze at them with his eyes? The sleep of the worker is sweet. Contentment. The sleep of the worker is sweet. Contentment whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich permits him no sleep. The desire for wealth is left unchecked and leads people straight to hell. And Paul gives us this verse in verse 10. He says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now hear me, it does not say money is evil, right? People like to misquote this verse and say, money is the root of all evil. No, the love of money is the root of all evil. Here's what Paul says, the love of money. But that's our constant motivation. Our constant, like, it's where our mind drifts with every moment of every day to stuff and things and money and resources. The love of money is the root of all kind of evil. And by craving it, some people have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. That's a word for all of us this morning. Because Jesus isn't going to take second chair to anyone or anything. He's not going to take second chair to your job, second chair to your spouse, second chair to your school performance, second chair to your friends, second chair to the comfort of your retirement, second chair to just surviving the day. Jesus will not take second chair to anyone or anything. So what do we do in 2019 in South Brayton? What, what do we do? How do we live lives marked by godliness with contentment? How can we avoid the tar pits of the love of money? First thing we have to do is we have to taste. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. We have to know that Jesus is good. We have to taste and see that the Lord is good. We have to experience the, the, the life of Christ in ourselves personally. Until we do that, we will never, ever, ever love him more than all things. But once we see Jesus for who he is, once he changes our life, we will see and experience the greatness, the goodness of him in our lives. And we will never settle for second best because Jesus is all we need and Jesus is the best. How do we do that? How do we taste and see that the Lord is good? How do we experience this inexpressible joy that Peter wrote about? We turn from our sin and we trust in Jesus. Okay, well, Paul, I've done that. Well, great. I also believe that we see the goodness of Christ. We taste the goodness of Christ through the ordinary means of grace. That's the, the worshiping together. That's the studying the word together. That's the communion with God through prayer, both together and individually. As we see Jesus for who he is, it, it, it's not rocket science. 
Like, we'll never taste and see that the Lord is good apart, apart from his word. Apart from his word, we will never taste and see that he's good. But we have his word. Once we've tasted and seen the goodness of Christ, we've experienced that joy that Peter writes about. Next, we invest. Six months ago, if I was writing this sermon, I would have used the phrase give, but I've changed my terminology a little bit using the word invest. We invest. We invest our resources for the good of others and the glory of God. That's where the mission comes in. We talked about godliness and contentment and mission. Once we know Jesus, once we are satisfied with Jesus, once we are content in who we are in Jesus, with Jesus, we invest for the mission of God. And I believe the starting place of that is the local church. I don't think that's the, the ending place, but I think that's the starting place. In Matthew chapter 6. Verses 19 through 21, he says, don't store up. This is the words of Christ. Don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moths nor, moths nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says, store up. I say, invest. Invest in the local church. What does that look that, that looks like finances, that looks like time, that looks like meaningful investment in the local church. The mission of God through the local church. Because the church is a family, right? The church is a family. And those that are content in Christ will invest in the church. Period. And I'm not embarrassed to say that. And some may be thinking, and I thought this way years ago, years ago. When we get out of debt, we'll start giving. Well, when this gets paid off, we'll start this. Well, when I get this bonus, we'll start this. Can I tell you, that thinking is flawed and it's nonsense. That's the devil feeding you a lie to get you to not invest yourselves and your resources in the local church. That's a lie from the pit of hell. To get you to want things more than Christ. I believe the starting place of our investment is the local church, but I do not believe that's the ending place. That's the starting place. And I, I share this with you knowing that just by sharing this with you publicly, the reward for our faithfulness is going to be decreased. But Victoria and I have committed ourselves to supporting the local church above a biblical tithe. Biblical tithe is a tenth. Tithe means tenth. And I believe that's the standard. I believe that's a standard. That's, that's, some guys say that's a starting place. Some guys say that's the goal to get to. But whatever it is, I would say that's a standard. Victoria and I committed years ago, before I was a pastor, years ago, that a tenth of everything we make, we give to our local church wherever that local church is, whether that's a big church down in Sarasota, whether that's a small little church plant in South Bradenton. Because I believe that is the investment God has called our family to make, and I believe that's the investment God calls followers of Christ to make. And we give beyond the local time. The, the, the time. We invest. Invest. once we're investing I think we make a goal for generous living that requires a cap a cap on our lifestyle and again this is things that Victoria and I have decided privately I'm sharing with you publicly not because you would say way to go I'm trying to set an example for my family we've decided to cap our lifestyle what do I mean by that? I mean, work hard. Make as much money as you can, but hear me, not so you can increase your standard of living. Not so that you can increase your standard of living, but more so that you can give more away for the good of others and the glory of God. And that's where this mission component comes in with contentment. 
so many of us, the, the American way is the more you make, the more you buy. Bigger house, bigger cars, bigger whatever, fill in the blank. The more you get, the more you, the more you earn, the more you go out and try to get. But contentment with godliness is a great gain. See, I think we, as Christians, should all implement the cap somewhere. That's between you and your spouse and the Lord. But every one of us needs to implement the cap. How much is enough? Enjoy the good gifts of God. Enjoy the good gifts. Enjoy the blessing of God through your labors. Yes, but not to excess. Not to where that becomes your master. Not where that becomes your overwhelming desire. Cap. Decide whatever level that is for your family, between you and your spouse and the Lord, decide where that level is and use the rest to advance the mission of God through the local church, through Christ-honoring mission agencies, just by helping people in need. Wouldn't you hate to have a family member have a need and say, oh, well, I'm sorry. It would be great to be in a position because we've made a conscious decision to set a cap on how we live. It would be great to be in a position to use your resources for the good of others and the glory of God. Contentment with godliness is great gain. And I will tell you, friends, that the only way this makes sense is if the gospel's real. The only way this makes sense is if the gospel is real. Because if the gospel isn't real, Paul says, we are fools to be pitied. If Christ hasn't raised from the dead, we, we Christians are among all people those to be pitied most. But I will tell you, the gospel is real. And Jesus is enough. I promise you, Jesus is enough. Enough. Heavenly Father, you are so good and so gracious. God, we love you. Lord, I pray that we would know down in our souls that you are enough. Father, that as the words of this next song say, that you would, you would rid us of our evil desires to where all that we want is you, God, that we would find contentment in Christ alone. It's in his name I pray.